tell you is about some thoughts I've had on risk taking. Now I'm doing something very different from the textbook, which is something you've read for many weeks. So I wanna give you some thoughts I have. You can think of it as my decision rules. It need not be yours. For me, I should start with what life sometimes feels like. It feels a bit like a maze. And I have to tell you, I dislike mazes. But the maze presents a very interesting problem for us, which is where are we going? Second, I'm stuck. How do I get unstuck? These are very important questions for us at every stage in life. Where are we going? How do we get unstuck? And what is the rule I use to discover where I should go? You know, our lives are shaped by circumstances, events, and choices. It's fashionable to think that we all have agency and we can do anything we want. But circumstances and events shape even what is in our choice set. What we could possibly choose between and among from. <clears throat> Human frailties. Here I'm talking about weaknesses for all humans, even the brightest, what are these? We don't see very clearly. This is what we call in behavioral science, cognitive biases. We don't see very well. We don't make sense of what we see very well. Not everyone who sees the same thing reaches the same conclusion. We misfire a lot, even very smart people. And then finally, we don't act and react appropriately. You know, this is what Simon called bounded rationality. Even if we know where we want to go, we don't know how to get there. That is what actions will get us there. So these are some facts for all humans. Of course, some are better than others, but these are, this is our human problem. We are blinded by the pursuit of opportunity. Often when we pursue one opportunity, we neglect others. We miscalculate risk. We only become aware of that later. We get blindsided. What are the circumstances and choices that shape our lives? I want to talk about four. The first in our modern world is work and money. Education, work and money. It rules our lives. Indeed, work and money soon becomes the very reason we exist. Everything we do is about work and money. We are constantly trying to sell ourselves, upgrade our resumes and so on. The other circumstances and choices, important ones that shape our lives, I call them friends and lovers. Some people have lots of friends and lots of lovers and some people don't have enough of those. And I spoke about this in week two when I talked about evidence on emotional well-being. Menting, you can come in. <laughs> okay. The other circumstances and choices that shape our lives, family. Now, this is mostly given to us. And family is a safety net, but it's also a double-edged sword. In many parts of the world, the family is there for you but the family also interferes in your life. That's the trade-off we make. And then the last circumstance and choice that shape our lives that I spoke about in week two is health. Our emotional well-being is hugely connected to or correlated with health. Not only our own health, but the health of the people that matter to us. It rules our lives. Now I want to talk about the mistakes we make. There are two types of mistakes in economics and statistics. We might call them type one and type two errors. The type one error is this. We're so risk averse that we pass on great opportunities. Indeed, many people become this way, especially if they've been wounded, if they've been hurt. They become very risk averse. The best example of this is someone who doesn't get up, get out of bed. Someone who doesn't venture too far from home. Because he or she is scared of getting into an accident. He's only <coughs> seeing one side of the probability distribution. 
The other extreme is we are so desperate that we take extreme risks. This is the type 2 error. So the type 1 error is we reject all drugs. So we reject a wonder drug. The FDA is so conservative. Type 2 is we take extreme risks. We accept everything. I like to think of it as crossing the Mediterranean on a small boat. How desperate these people must be that they're willing to take that chance. So, broadly speaking, type 1 and type 2 errors rule our lives. But I also want to say this, know this. Many times not taking a chance is very risky. Playing safe is the riskiest thing to do in your life. And my observation is that MBA students are very risk averse. And young students are especially risk averse. And I say to you, if you don't take a risk, you cannot live a grand life. A grand life is not necessarily about money. A grand life is about experience, about triumphs and failures. You can't live a grand life without taking some big risks. Something which is in the unknown. And I'm going to speak about that as well in a few minutes. I want to speak briefly about regrets. We all have them. Different kinds of regrets. The most fundamental regret for many people is what we call foundational regrets. Regrets having to do with education and money. You won't have that first regret. You won't have it. But I want you to know, even very wealthy people, very educated people have regrets about money. Lots of very educated people don't have much money. They don't save very well. They don't invest very well. And that's something that becomes clearer as they age. If you look at the savings profile of the American family, 50% of American households have $0. Zero. Only 20% have $100,000 or more. And of course, the top 1% has a lot of money. So savings and investment is a culture. It's a habit that is developed over many, many years. So education and money. And you're going to see now that I'm going to start plugging in TV shows and music and all these things for which I'm not even getting paid. Money heist. You might have seen this. If you haven't, you should. <laughs> I've just committed you to about 100 hours of TV watching. <laughs> I think it's three or four or five seasons. I guess the moral to the story, even though it glamorizes bank robbery, I want to say to you, you do not want to end up as a bank robber. So that's regret one, foundational education and money. Second regret, this is one that humans keep saying over and over again, not only in surveys, but this is the stuff of fiction. Boldness regret. I didn't stand up to somebody. I didn't stand for something. I should have fought alongside him. I shouldn't stand, I should have stood up to my bully. I should have taken that chance. I should have asked that girl to marry me. These are the things people keep saying over and over again. I want to show you this. Now I'm going back in time. This is before sunrise. Judy Delpy and Ethan Hawke. Ah, uh, Richard Linklater is the name of the guy who produces this film. He is a brilliant guy. He took the same two actors and made a movie in 95 and 2004 and 2013. In 95, these were two strangers that met on a train and who spent one evening in Vienna. And it doesn't even feel like a movie. It feels like two people just talking. And you're thinking, are these two going to get together or not? And nine years later, they're still talking. And another nine years later, they're together with bickering. Is that what life is about? You begin to wonder. But they're still together, but just bickering a little bit. So this is boldness. That's the most common regret for most human beings. Third one. This is the one that gnaws at people, is deceit, disloyalty, cruelty. I mean, we are the bad people. This is the one where your conscience is pricking. You were the bully. You were the one who was not so nice to somebody. Now here I'm plugging in K-drama, the glory. If you like revenge dramas, this is it. Now the characters in this show have no conscience at all. So you feel quite good about them getting beaten up. 
badly. So I want you to know this, that educated people can be idiots. My wife tells me this all the time. <laughs> okay. They're as vulnerable as anyone else to boldness, disloyalty, and money regrets. We should be aware of this. Just the awareness of it itself is kind of quite valuable. Think about these things, what really, really, really matters to you. And what are you willing to risk for it? Now, even amongst some of the guys who have shown up here, some of whom have been my friends for many years, like Barbara Abbas, who just walked in. Very good day. <laughs> Class of 2013. Who spent like 20 years at one firm before going and becoming an entrepreneur. And his firm has absolutely taken off. And it produces something very unsexy. So unsexy, I can't even describe it. <laughs> okay, but I'll let him describe it during the break. Success has come slowly to them, and I'm very, very pleased. So the question is, what really, really matters to you, and what are you willing to risk for it? What are you willing to give up for it? Don't be trapped by a paycheck. Too many people are. If you're used to a big home, a fancy car, and a Montessori school for your kids, you're trapped. Fact, you're trapped. Don't be trapped. That's what I'm trying to tell you. And don't ever bet your home, your partner, and your children on anything. But I'm going to give you some things to think about in terms of bets. I want to talk about work and success. And I deliberately chose a canvas that is blank because I want you to paint it for yourself. Don't let somebody else do it for you. You've got to do it. And it's very easy to be typecast. If you spend a few years in any profession, you will be so. The important question is this, and this is the question from week three production. It's not about whether you can calculate the marginal product of labor or capital. That's of second order importance. It is, are you even doing the right things? If you're doing the right things, everything is perfect. Everything is of second or third order importance. Observation from surveys. Most people are unhappy with what they're doing. Even people who make a lot of money are unhappy with what they're doing. Good example is lawyers. They hate being in law. But high opportunity cost, costly to walk away. So are you even doing the right thing? That would be my question for you. And I'm going to ask you some more as I go along. What you're good at and what you want may not be the same thing. I love this little example of this guy. Now, I don't watch basketball much anymore. My son does, and he tells me about all these players. And occasionally, I watch the highlights, and this guy is 27 years old. He's won two MVPs, I believe, won the NBA title. And then he said this, and then I liked him even more. <laughs> basketball is not the main thing in my life. It's just something I'm good at. Wow, I said, this is maturity. Then he says, Rivan, I want to go home. Home is Serbia. And he says, I want to go and ride my horses. And I thought to myself, the guy's seven feet tall. <laughs> that must be an animal rights violation. <laughs> success. What is your idea of success? It's important for us to know this. Is it a title? Is it a high salary? Is it working for a prestigious firm? Is it doing something on your own? Is it having economic freedom with your time what is your idea of success everybody will have something different sometimes success comes early like for these four guys who were mega stars at the age of 20 or 21 the Beatles their very first album was a huge hit please please me 1962 I think every song in that album was number one at some point in time some of you may have even heard it. And then there are other prodigies, more modern ones that you're familiar with, like this lady, who is remarkable. Not just for the money she earns. Huh? For me, what is remarkable is stage presence, ability to connect with a very diverse and big audience, charisma. Charisma can never be bottled and sold, never produced in a factory. 
Charisma is what the French would call the je ne sais quoi, that intangible that cannot be described. Let me give you some other prodigies, just to show you I'm very modern. <laughs> this is BTS. Now, if you've got children, like I have, I've got a 20-year-old and a 26-year-old, I am not directly familiar with these things, but I've become familiar. BTS, Shiny, EXO, Girls' Generation, Blackpink, I know all of them. <laughs> I even know their dance moves. <laughs> K-drama dance moves. I mean, I won't do it here, but I know them. I know them. Remarkable. Last year, yeah, a year ago I went to Korea and uh, BTS was having a concert. Scott, please come in. BTS was having a concert in Busan and this was their last concert. It's a free concert before they took a pause because two of them, I think, were joining the army. And there were thousands of foreigners, thousands of them who have come just to see BTS. Thousands of people across the world are learning Korean because of BTS. This is what we call soft power, ability to shift opinion. Scott Lorenz for everybody. Hi, everybody. Sorry to interrupt. Now, Scott's remarkable because uh, he's my very old. All you UFC graduates and went to accredited universities. No, no, that's not the reason why. But he's remarkable because. Uh, He was my student 33 years ago, when I was a young graduate student. Mm -hmm. I got a PhD at age 12. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he was a freshman, I think, and we became friends. And we still are. Thank you for coming, Scott. Thank you. So, and then sometimes success comes slowly. Like these guys, most of you will never know them. But these guys actually became successful when at least two of them had children in high school. Fleetwood Mac, rumors, 1977, is when they really hit it big. And your parents probably listen to this music, which means you won't. <laughs> That's the important thing. My children will never listen to music that I do. My son likes to say I listen to dead musicians, which is true, <laughs> absolutely true. But I'm very current, thanks to them. I'm going to give you some, plug in some guys and broaden your horizon. This guy, his name is Tumani Diabate. He plays an instrument called the Kora. He's from Mali. He is a, a griot, a keeper of oral tradition. And remember, in many parts of the world, there is nothing written. It is passed on through words and through practice. And his album in 2006 with Ali Farka Toure is a masterpiece. Music is universal. This is instrumental music at its best. Let me show you another one. This guy, spectacular. 78, he's having his moment right now. Ustad Noor Baksh, playing in small concert halls in Europe. He plays an instrument called the Benju. He's from Baluchistan. No, now Baba would object to me because this is actually Pakistan. Okay, so let me say that. So, check him out, remarkable. 78 years old, discovered now. So there are late bloomers. Some people are very clear about what they want. I'm going to give you two models. One model is this guy, extensively studied, Pablo Picasso. His model of doing things, and over the course of his life, he had many different, let's call it, <coughs> uh, phases. And in one phase, he describes his philosophy of creating art. This was from 1938. This is his painting called The Rooster, where he says, I paint objects as I think them, not see them. So this is a model in which a person says, I'm going to do this. I imagine it in my head and I do it. So this is one model. This is the genius model, obviously, if you could pull it off. But here's the other model. Some people are never quite sure. I put myself in this category, but I'm not Cezanne. This is Cezanne. Paul Cezanne was never sure what he was trying to do. His model was, I don't know what I'm trying to do till I do it. 
I am discovering through what I do, what I want to do and what I should be doing. It's a different model for what guides our life. And this is one of his more famous paintings. He had his biggest success, not during his life, but his most successful pieces of work were things he put together at the age of 60. Whereas for Picasso, it was the age of 20. So there are prodigies and late bloomers. This is the, uh, this is the, uh, the late bloomer model. So models are conceptual innovators. That's the Picasso model, where the person knows where he or she is trying to go and how to do it. See, the second part is also important. Where am I trying to go and how to do it? The second part is, I don't know where I'm going. Let me do something. And let me discover if this is taking me to where I want to go. So I let you figure out what your model is. But I want to tell you about my metaphor. For me, I think of things in terms of trains. I love trains. I loved them as a kid. My son loved them. I took him on lots of train rides throughout the country, throughout Canada as well. But I constantly ask myself this question, which train do I want to get on? And I ask myself this question, is the train headed in the right direction? I'm not worried about destination. Is it headed in the right direction? And second, am I with the right people? If I have to reflect on my life and I'm older than everybody here, I would say that I never chose the train, the train chose me. I am very sure. I never tried to be a professor. I never even tried to be a professor at University of Chicago. If I tried, I wouldn't have happened. I tried many other things that didn't work. So for me, I have now learned this idea of being random. What do I mean by random? Hang around places where the right trains might show up so that the train will call your name. And if the right people are there with you, go along for the ride with them. That's my model. I mean it. If I like the people, I'll go along for the ride with them. And of course, if something changes, I get off at the next station and turn around and go somewhere else. I want to talk about this thing called time. We all live, we all have a finite life and time is very critical. Time is the thief that steals. It steals our youth. It steals our good looks. And most importantly, it steals our possibilities. Our possibilities narrow as we get older. The things you can do when you're 25, you can't do when you're 35. That all those roads have been closed. And even more important, no rewinds, no replays, not like a VCR or DVD player. We don't get second chances. Many times I've thought, what the hell just happened here? Can I go back? No, I can't. I got to do it real time like you and me. We got to do it real time. And when there's something very critical, no time to contemplate. We have to act now. So all of us have to refine our instincts. And I know that we are living longer and I know that with education, we might think that we can plan everything out. <laughs> no, we have uncertain stopping time. That's a statistics way of saying we could die anytime. And we have to be ready to act in that moment because the next moment that opportunity is gone. All moments in time are not equally significant or important. I think of this when I watch a game of sport. Now I've become older, so many moments in a game bore me. And I end up watching 90 minutes of a game, let's say, for possibly 30 seconds of glory. That is our life. We are slogging like crazy for that extraordinary moment, for that priceless moment, which will give us memories for life. Some moments are priceless, etched in our memory, like that first kiss, which all of you are thinking about right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give it some time. 
God bless them wherever they are. <laughs> <laughs> the birth of your child, special moment, and many others. Time, I've thought a lot about this. People often ask me, are you very busy? No, I'm not. I try my damned hardest best to not be busy. So that I keep a lot of time to do things that give me connection and meaning. If I enjoy something, I will do it. I also learned one thing as I went older. My time is not mine. I have to give it to somebody else. My wife, my daughter, my son. I let them decide what they want to do. Finding connection and meaning. And if that means cutting your lawn, do it. I don't enjoy it. But if you like gardening, do it. If you like cooking, do it. Don't fill your schedule with what is called joyless urgency. No. Love and loss. I want to show you this. This is Anahata Chakra. This is actually 12 lotus petals with two intersecting triangles in India. Union of man and woman. Okay. I want to talk about love and loss because loving is the ultimate risk. The ultimate risk where we can lose it all. The Anahata Chakra is like a wheel that spins within us. And in India we believe that the Anahata Chakra is associated with unconditional love, compassion, empathy, forgiveness. It's not just about Romantic love, love for others, love for things, love for living. The first thing I say, I said this in this class, you have to love yourself. In India, we call this Atma Prema, love for your own soul. This is not narcissism. This is expecting high standards of yourself, being disappointed with yourself, but also forgiving yourself. If you don't love yourself, others can't love you. You make it very hard. Love for craft, for your work. So I want to present to you a few people. But I ask this question. Do you love your craft enough that you would dedicate your life to it? I want to give you some examples. Like this lady here who was born in France, Coco Chanel, sometime during World War I or thereabouts, abandoned by her father, mother, is admitted to a mental institution. She and her sister are taken in to by Catholic nuns who teach her how to stitch and sew. And she goes on to become a fashion legend. One very determined woman from impoverished or orphan to couturier, setting the standards for high fashion in the world. To this lady, whom most people won't recognize, she is not a billionaire. Never made that much money, but changed the world, Maria Montessori. And the world of education. World of, changed the way people think about education. I also want to talk about love. That thing that we don't talk about in booth classes. But it is in fact connected to risk taking. Love is the ultimate risk. And it is a risk that humans are willing to take for a moment of bliss. That is the ultimate price, bliss. Whatever that means, you will know it when you experience it. And indeed, when we are in love, we are vulnerable. Because suddenly somebody else's life matters a lot to you. You are stressed, as in physically stressed, not just emotionally. And then, even worse, you're not in charge. Neither is the other person. Indeed, there is this mysterious force that seems to control things. And either it happens or it doesn't. And you're at the mercy of the god of love, Cupid or Eros or whatever. And they are very temperamental gods. So you don't know how long this lasts. But love also means risks. And before I come to risks, I wanted to talk about words on love. Because Shakespeare describes love as a form of madness. This is from Romeo and Juliet. 
Now, I don't know how many of you have seen <coughs> high schoolers in love. Some of you may have been that. So, you've experienced it. Every now and then, I go to a library almost every day. And every now and then, I see two high schoolers. No, everybody sees them. Everybody knows. And to be honest, I don't know whether to laugh or cry. <laughs> it's like, when is this God of love going to take this away from them? <laughs> They're on such a high, you can't live like that forever. By the way, that's the reason why adults can't take this kind of love. They die. You can't take this intensity. You have to be like a teenager or 20-something person. So Shakespeare says it's madness. But Nietzsche says there's always madness in love. But there's always reason in madness. By the way, in Shakespeare's case, Ryan, please come in. Please, sit down. And I love what Robert Frost said about love. Love is an irresistible desire to be irresistibly desired. This is what humans are. We desperately want to be desperately special to somebody. <clears throat> love and K-dramas. You should watch them. Because it's a slow burn. <laughs> now, three years ago, this is the pandemic. My wife tells me one day, I want you to watch the show with me. I say, okay, I like your dramas. I like the thriller genre, but I'll try this one out. This one is called Crash Landing on You. Now, I knew in episode two, two where this was going. He's from North Korea. She's from South Korea. They meet in North Korea through some fantastic accident. I knew where this was going. <laughs> and the rational part of me said, don't do it. Don't do it. Just go back to South Korea. <laughs> no, but then we won't have a drama. And this is a drama. And of course, a love story takes especially great meaning when the forces are decked against you. And here everybody is against them. I had to not just get Kleenex, I had to get towels ready. <laughs> and my wife made me watch it twice. <laughs> and I think one message from K-dramas is that even if there's a small chance that you will succeed, you should do it. I guess that's the message. It's an edge of the seat thriller. And you get sucked into it. By the time you get to episode seven, you need to binge watch it. <laughs> like, let's just get to the end and let's get over with it. Their chemistry was so remarkable, I said, they must have something going with each other. And sure enough, they did. The whole world was guessing. But love also means loss. And that's something that all of us already know. Um, I want to speak about something very special for me my parents, whom I lost in the last four years. I'm going to show you a picture of them, my father and mother, on their marriage day, 1961, in southern India. Um, I'm not mourning them. They both lived fantastic lives. My parents were fantastic parents. Our Jason has met them. Um, they were way ahead of their time. They were very open-minded. And it was therefore not a surprise that all my friends and subsequently my sister's friends hung out in our house because we could be ourselves. So I'm sure my father is looking and saying, this guy turned out all right. <laughs> and my mother's probably saying, I always knew that. Um, for those who are not with a parent, a sibling or a beloved, I bring to you a little poem from Rumi, the Persian poet of love. Goodbyes are only for those who love with their eyes. Because for those who love with their heart and soul, there's no such thing as separation. And humans need to believe that. Ah, uh, let me switch to tightrope walking, risk taking, which all of us do in different ways in our lives. Education of this kind and every other kind emphasizes deliberate planning, skills you're developing slowly that you would deploy over weeks and months at a time. It actually underemphasizes opportunism, reactive, quick decision making. But you know, the world is full of randomness. There are many things that happen that we can't anticipate, like the pandemic. 
So it really depends on whether you can respond very quickly to what happens. And in some ways, formal education gets in the way. It stops you from doing things instinctively. So spectacular success is often the result of opportunism. The most thrilling experiences in life are unplanned. In fact, you look at the biographies of the great men and women of history, they are always open to new things. They're always ready for new experiences. I'm going to tell you about a movie character. But I'm going to start with this principle. Embrace the unknown. Because one of the things I observe is many young people want to plan their lives. Recently, I spoke to a student of mine who works for a company and has done very well. And she wanted to call me to tell me about her career options. Spent 20 minutes talking about the job she has and two other opportunities she's interviewing for. And she spent a few minutes telling me about how she sees her career going. And I listened to her and I said to her, my God, Neha, this is emotionally draining even for me. <laughs> Don't do it. You'll kill yourself. Don't do this over planning. She asked me, what do I do? I just try my best now and accept that most things I do will fail. Start with that. Most things you do will fail. Don't expect everything that you want to be given to you. No. You might get something even better than you expected. Embrace the unknown. I want to show you a picture of this guy. You know, this is a movie from many years ago. And you know his favorite line in the movie? Life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. That's his line. He repeats it over and over again. And what is noteworthy about his decision-making model is he is not computational. He is not manipulative. He is not looking too far ahead. He is guided by two things. Loyalty to his friends and love. That's it. And yes, I know it's a fictional character. But I often wonder to myself, are all these people who are planning assiduously, thinking about the future in great detail, doing any better than this guy? Because a guy like this is also grateful for what he's got. Whereas a guy who is ruthlessly planning is often thinking that fate cheated for her. I ask you for yourself to think about what your model should be. Two things I believe every human will need. No matter whether you have an MBA or not, imagination. Imagination is our ability to conjure up things, to get beyond cognitive biases, to see possibilities. Second is courage. Courage to do something very bold. Courage means that you could lose it all. Two things to say about imagination. They're held back by a closed mind. And we know from a lot of experiments that have been done and many people, despite saying that they're open-minded, are actually quite close-minded. So try your best to have an open mind, to change your mind, to accept new possibilities. And finally, with regards to courage, it can't be faked. For the Greeks, the ancient Greeks, courage was the highest virtue of them all. A person with courage was a person to be lauded, to be respected. Somehow that courage doesn't have the same connotation today. I want to tell you this. I'm plugging in movies and shows. Here's an Indian film, Zindagi Na Milegi Dubara. This is an Indian way of saying YOLO. <laughs> okay. No second chances of life. So things to contemplate for you. I've said this to you before. All of you are in the most important decade of your life your 20s and early 30s. OK, mid 30s and sometimes late 40s. <laughs> I'll give some allowance for my guests. Yeah. Things to contemplate. What matters to you? And how do you want to live your life? Because I think it's actually possible for every person 
to live a very good life. I'm not talking about billions of dollars. That is, it has to be in your fate. For all of you, I want to say the future is now. So on that note, this is the end of the term. So I want to get back to my glass.